Yeah, well, well, thank you all. And yeah, it's just kind of a, um, a heads up or summary of what I'll be doing today is giving you just kind of a brief overview of our training of, of what Qualtrics can do. So giving an example of uh, but walking through the product, an example of building on a survey, what it's like to upload participants, distribute a survey, run basic analysis. And really at any time, if there's any questions, just feel free to chat those over. I'm happy to field those whenever. And um, there's a better time to address those in the, in the summary. I'll, I'll, I'll do that as well. But I'll get started. I'll share my screen. Make sure we share the right one. Okay. And if there's any issues with the screen share, just, just feel free to let me know. So what I've done here, I've just I've logged in already to a Qualtrics account. Uh, for the folks here, if you haven't created an account before, you would go to fsu.qualtrics.com. This just redirects to your. Uh, the, it looks like you all set up under um, ADFS or essentially just your university login system. So you would just you would just access it all right there, and then you would be good to go. You would get logged in. Uh, mine obviously has some some content already built down here, so it's a little. A little bit more built up, but this is generally what that would look like there. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll just show is if you were to go actually create a survey, you would just click on create new project. And that button will appear in a few places, but generally on the bottom left. And I'm just going to create survey. There's different options, but most of the time we see, especially in higher ed, they're, they're working with just a, a general survey project. So you, you can name it. You can put it in folders. It's all up to you. And then once I create that, that's just going to pull me into the editing section. Um, if you want to log in, that is totally fine. I mean, we'll have this recorded so you can you can log in afterwards and play around as well. But totally up to you if you, if you want to do that. But again, just to show, uh, I'll just kind of show some some common things that we that we find within higher ed or, or common types of surveys. So as you can see, this this put me into the editing section. This is where you would go to actually add the content of your survey. By default, we just pull multiple choice type questions just because they're the most commonly used type questions within the surveying world. But everything you see, you can click on, you can edit this. So we can come in here and say something like, what is your major? Something really basic here. And if you wanted to pull like an other option, you can do that. If you click on this drop down, you'll see an option to allow a X entry there. So just a really basic first, first question there. Um, a lot more options you can do over here on the left, depending on the type of question you're asking. So, for example, in, this, in the surveying world, typically a, a circle means a single select. If you wanted to add that, make it a multi-select, you can do that there. Yep, and I can also I can also touch on those things as well as what's included in what we call core XM advance. So, just just a kind of heads up over the past well over a few years we've add a lot more features and capabilities. Some of those are on the reporting side, so we'll touch on those. Uh, and some of those are in here as well. Some some things that I'll also show in here in a second are the different types of questions that we can ask. But anyways, just to summarize over here on the left, different options, depending on the type of question you're asking. There's there's quite a bit that's available, but again, you can see those and play around with those as, as you would like. Uh, something that would be used quite frequently or adding requirements or forced a response before they move on with the survey. It's pretty common that we see, especially because of IRE policy, uh, consent forms. So you know, do you consent? And obviously you might have the actual consent form in there. Uh, I can obviously edit that, make this a yes, no. So if we had a consent form that did to say yes or no to, we can do that there. Craig, do you want questions as we go along or hold them until later? Yeah, you can just fire them off whenever. Yeah. Yep, the question is regarding there. to the block Q2, the do you consent sometimes has more elaborate. And in fact, the Institutional Review Board will require consents to be built in to questionnaires. So mm -hmm. whereas the example that you gave is a really good one, do you consent? Often they're longer. They're even more elaborate than yeah. is appearing here. So. What are the suggestions for building in IRB ready surveys with one of the blocks being about consent? Yeah, I mean, I have seen a few things, and this, this is something that for the, the central IT folks, but you can require certain blocks or certain questions that are to, to be 
included in all surveys. Uh, the most commonly we see universities that the, it's just knowledge for all researchers that they have to include the consent form or the survey policy as the first part of the survey. Typically what they do, they make that the first part of the survey. They put a page break so they have to consent or not consent. If it's quite lengthy, sometimes we'll see they'll put a, they'll hyperlink the IRB policy in there. Again, it's, it's just all up to the university on what's required and what's not required or how they how they provide that. Um, more often than not, we're finding a lot of universities and other research organizations that will provide a summarized view for participants, and it's just a quick understanding of the of the data. Unfortunately, uh, historically, IRB can make these really lengthy, almost like legally read documents that just a general survey participant doesn't really read or, or understand. So just giving the summarized version of, hey, this is the purpose of the project. This is what's done with the data. This is your right to erasure, things such as that, putting that in there and summarizing them. Those are typically best practices, again, because uh, especially this day and age where, you know, if you go overseas and you click on a website, you're constantly met with this allow and don't allow. And it's just, it's come to the point now where so many people um, yeah, they just don't actually go into it. So anyways, that's just some of the best practices we've seen there. But again, you can hyperlink it if you want to put it. Some actually require the PDF. So if they have the PDF available in the library, so what can happen is IRB can, and I can send a restrictions afterwards as well, uh, just for time's sake. But you all, as the academic um, technology folks, you can upload and post content PDFs into the library. And that can then be used by anybody. They, they take that, they insert the graph. It's technically considered a graphic, but it can be a message. It can be whatever, and they can pull that in there. So if, if it is a PDF of the actual uh, consent form, put that in there. And Craig, I'm sorry, let me just go into the details because this is, is relevant for uh, the regulations that do require IRB. The recommendation is to include a PDF or a hyperlink or um, for fear that um, some participants won't read any of the you know check boxes or all the legal requirements on a survey, if there are legal requirements. The suggestion was linked to a PDF or linked to a hyperlink, for example. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to, I'm just speaking openly and what I'm finding from other clients, it's just that the, 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 the and at the end of the day, it's all to your IRB. You know, there's nothing I can do or say to, it's up to your IRB and what's included and what's not included again. But I'm just saying what the best practice has been is that they will typically link to the full IRB policy. And then they provide a summarized, um, again, just a summary of what's actually pertinent to the type of study for the survey recipient to look at. And the most things that they're going to be concerned about are levels of anonymity. So what's actually done with the data, how it's connected to either their email, their name, their student ID, faculty ID, or whatnot, as well as what's done with the data, how it's disclosed, how it's kept private. And, and the reality is it's depending on the type of survey project you're running, you might run up against certain compliances. So for example, if we were coming from a health center, we might be crossing into PHI data. And so there's different compliances that are involved uh, in, in different levels of awareness for the survey, survey recipient to be, uh, for them to know about. If we're dealing with FERPA you know, student data, FERPA might be involved. If we're dealing with uh, surveying minors, there's usually a, it, we, by most researchers want to pay close attention to the wording used because they want minors to understand what they're being a part of, as well as understanding for their parents, so attempt to, if we we work with a lot of child labs in their survey, first they send a consent form to the parents for them to understand or to the guardian for on behalf of their children, just because obviously they might not, in some cases, not actually able to read. They're they're taking more of a graphic based survey, but anyway, so summarizing has been a very popular thing, just because most uh, most aren't going to read these these lengthy documents before. Um, yeah, any, any follow up on that or any clarification there? Okay. 
So just to, to highlight a few other types of questions, I would say within the surveying world, the three most commonly used questions are going to be your multiple choice set questions, your Likert scales. This is, you know, where we we take items on the left, we provide scale points. And if I were to just um, do this quickly instead of having to type these out, you know, I could do like a five point agree to disagree scale, um, type in the statements on the left, type in the question header. Pretty commonly used type of survey question within the surveying world. <clears throat> the other type, I would say, just text entry based question. So this is where we're actually typing something out. It might be actually putting in type of an essay format. All that's up to you. Sometimes we're seeing more and more, especially for lengthy documents, where an individual might be required to just attach a file. So they might have a document that they have. They type something on their computer. Sometimes we see this in a curriculum where students will be required to attach an assignment. So this is something included now with um, the newer uh, structure of the licenses, the ability to upload files here. And then beyond that, again, there are quite a few different types of questions. Those are the three most commonly used types of questions. But there are things such as like slider scales. This is in, in some ways can be a simpler way to visualize um, something. So if we're talking about percentages or doing a number scale from one to five, you can set the minimum, the maximum, all that's up to you. As well, there's forms. These are pretty common, especially for, for signups. We're using Qualtrics beyond surveying for doing just forms or um, any type of just simple data entry. So if we're asking for individuals to enter their first name, last name, to sign up for clubs, to sign up for activities, research projects, anything like that, this is where we can come in here quickly and add things such as, you know, please enter your first name, your address, and so forth. This is a common use case we see for alumni departments that use Qualtrics as a way for alumni outreach, as well as to update current addresses or current contact information. So a lot of times we'll see alumni departments will reach out to their uh, alumni on a yearly basis, making them aware of events, um, where things university is doing, and also to ask, they, they'll prompt them with the contact information that they have on record, and they'll ask them to update that if, if need be. So again, I would say some of the most common, those are some of those common type of questions. One thing uh, I'll mention here that we see, it's pretty popular within the surveying world. Is just a way to validate responses. And when we say validate responses, we we want to ensure that the individual taking the survey actually was reading the contents, they were paying attention. So we a lot of times we'll see researchers will put timers on the survey or timers on pages. And this will allow you within the data analysis to see how long the individual was on a certain page or the entire survey. The idea behind this is that you can set up filters to filter out responses that were below a certain time threshold. The idea being is that if you had a, let's say a 20 question survey, you determined that it should take no less than 15 minutes. And if anybody did take less than 15, they probably sped through it and you can pull their, their responses out just based off that, uh, that logic that they might not have actually gone through the survey itself. Another couple of things that are now included is signature type. This is the ability for an individual to provide a signature. So any type of like e-consent or sometimes we see researchers who go in the field, they'll take a survey. Um, one of the things available now is it's called the offline capability. That's for the ability for researchers to download a survey locally. So you create the survey within Qualtrics. You take your tablet, you download it onto the Qualtrics app. You can then take that survey offline. So especially useful, useful for researchers who go out in the field or go overseas or in areas where they can't depend on uh, 5G or LTE or anything like, or Wi-Fi. So you can go and take the survey there. This is where a signature might make sense because an individual might provide some sort of consent or e-consent that they actually were the one that provided that type of feedback. One thing I'll mention. What are, what, are, what are the limits of the survey size for an offline uh, survey? In other words, if they download it somewhere else, maybe taking it on their smartphone if they're in a non-cell zone out in the field. Uh, so there's no limit. 
on the the size as well. There's no limit on the the, the data that can be collected. The idea behind this is that they go offline, they take the survey, they for the individuals, they come back to Wi-Fi and they get a push notification asking them to essentially push all this data up into their Qualtrics account. And so generally that's where you would go to to run all your data analysis, to if you wanted to download your data, you're gonna do that from just your general Qualtrics account. The the Qualtrics offline app is really just for the situation where we need to uh, take the survey offline. So a, a few things I was going to mention just around different logic logics. So we have the ability to skip participants in different parts of the survey or to display content based off of answers or based off of information we know about the survey recipient. So for example, if um, within here, if this individual says they do not consent, they consent, we can skip them to a different question. For example, if they say no, they don't consent, consent we can Pick them out, push them to the end of the survey. So just a really basic example there of how typically a consent form is built out with that type of logic. As well as we can come in here and display logic is when we display a question based off of some previous condition. So if, for example, they said that education was selected as their major, we can display this, this question. We can also base this off of what's called embedded data. So embedded data is going to be information about your survey recipients that you have on them beforehand. The idea is that if, let's say, you're surveying a 1,000 students, you have this information from your SIS, you take this, you upload it as a spreadsheet into Qualtrics. Within here, we might have fields, uh, you know, obviously their first name, last name. We might have their year in school. And we could say, as an example, if their year in school is equal to or greater than three, that we can show this question. The idea here is that based off their credit hours or their, their tenure, we can show or not show a specific questions or content. And again, this example is based off of fields from a file that we have on those individuals. And there's also a variety of other ways to do this. Some more advanced things, we can pull in GOIP locations. So even we can pull in certain parts of the state or certain parts of the country or world that are based off of GOIP. Uh, we can also pull a device type. So if their device type is a mobile or iPhone or, or any of these devices, then we can show or not show questions. Something kind of interesting we're seeing with researchers is that there's this understanding that survey recipients are willing to spend more time on a survey if they're on a laptop or, or desktop as opposed to being on a phone. They're typically not willing to spend as much time. So some things we've seen is that researchers will consolidate or shorten a survey based on the device type you're coming from. Um, again, that's just based off the idea that a research is showing that individuals are less likely to do lengthier tasks on a smartphone than if they were on a laptop. So anyways, just using different criteria to show or not show content. And the last level is what we call branching. This is when we come in here and create entire different sections of the surveys. We can create essentially surveys within the survey. And this is when we can come in here and say, well, let's create different flows or branches. And as an example, we could come in here and say, just as I did before, if in a question they said what their major is and they said it's engineering, we can skip them to this question or this set of questions, essentially this block. So we we sometimes will see researchers will create these these master surveys and then based off of information we have on the student or faculty or or participant we can show or not show content and dynamically adapt the survey further for this particular individual um, obviously in the surveying world the shorter we can make a survey or the the more seamless we can make a survey experience that increases our response rates. It increases the likelihood that they'll, they'll take future surveys. So it, a big no-no, especially in today's world, is asking questions that are just irrelevant. You know, for example, if we asked military status and they said they're not active military, and then we start asking questions about their current military experience, obviously missed the mark. 
we're asking them things that are not pertinent our likelihood of getting that survey uh, closed out or not completed is, is fairly high so anything that we can do to dynamically make the survey experience unique for the individual definitely increases our response rates and there's a few things in here um, there's quite a bit in here but those are the most commonly used things the other things that are used are randomizers Randomizers are just the way that we can randomly assign individuals to certain sections or certain blocks. Well, we see this a lot within uh, behavioral research where we'll randomly assign individuals to certain con either control groups or variable groups. And we can see we, who was sent to where. Um, and we can also ensure that it's evenly represented just because with any randomizer, there's a, there's a chance that it might not be evenly distributed. But this is just a way that we can randomly assign those options there. Let's see. Going forward, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about distributions, different methods. So this is assuming that we we built out a survey. There's a few ways that we can actually get this sent out. Most common, more, yeah, one of the most common, I would say is just to send out a generic or to po take a generic survey link. So this just allows you to take an anonymous link. Anybody who clicks on this link can um, take that survey. You can post this on a website, throw it up to the listserv, really basic. Uh, more common method now is to, to, to personalize experience to email these surveys out. So this is when uh, we create some sort of survey message that goes that gets sent out. This is these items here include the survey link. So what happens with this type of distribution is that every individual receives a unique link. So because it's unique, it's it's a default saving continue, which means that if a recipient clicked on the link, got halfway through the survey, they can X that. They can also come back on a different device. And because of the link itself, we would recognize that we'll start them where they left off. So we would just try to again make that experience as easy as possible for them. With this type of option, this is this is when we are uploading a spreadsheet into Qualtrics, and that spreadsheet is going to include information about the students. So this is a, a thing that was rolled out recently for you all. Um, let me get rid of these. I have a filter set up, so I just want to undo this filter so we can actually see some individuals. This is just showing all the individuals I have uploaded into my um, into my list. So you add them. We can upload. We typically upload from a file from your computer. You can do a manual upload. It's just probably not the most common way to do this. But this is just an example there. But at least to visualize this, the only thing that we actually need are their email, first name, and last name. Things like phone number. It's up to you if you want to include that. You can add I, other criteria. So as the you know the, the previous example in the survey, I said year in school. So if we did happen to have that, oops, deleting that. Just gonna leave it a year in school. Anyways, we could we could add those. So any other fields that you have, you can upload those into Qualtrics. Uh, you can use those again for the the dynamic way of showing or not showing content, as well as within the survey results. So if we wanted to create filtered views based off of um, demographic information, you can set all that up. Get this back here. So the idea of this type of this type of format, we can see an individual here on the right. We can pull in all the any demographic fields that we have, any attributes, anything that's uploaded for this individual. We can also look at things like timelines when they took surveys any lists that they're part of. We can also look at statistics. So we can look at things like the, the amount of times they were invited to a survey, the amount of times they responded, their total response rate. So this is across all surveys. Their last invitation. Uh, this is essentially given a, a broad view of this individual's survey taking um, history. So again, just to see that all there. Once we have all these, in, these individuals in here, this is when we go out and create distributions. Basically the same way as doing before, um, but that is an option there. 
one thing that is done as well, um, I'm not sure if the previous rep mentioned this. So we do have an SMS capability. So the SMS capability goes through a provider called Twilio. And so what happens is basically we can, and that's the most common one. There's actually other providers we can go through. So if, as an example, you all wanted to connect to Twilio, we can connect to your Twilio account, which is essentially just a lie to distribute those surveys as an SMS. So what happens, it can do a couple of things. It can text out the link to the survey. This is assuming they're on the smartphone. They receive the text, they click on the link, it pulls it up in a browser, they take the survey as normal. The other option is what we call traditional two-way SMS. And this is when an individual receives a survey one question at a time. They then respond to the first question with some sort of value that corresponds to an answer choice. Then they receive the second question and so forth. To give an example, if you've ever interacted with Sprint or AT&T support or some of the airlines, they use the same thing. It's, again, a simple way that they can individual can essentially text for the survey response. So for that type of option, obviously, the survey is limited to a very short survey. It's useful for getting really quick feedback just because an individual is not as likely to take a lengthy survey in an SMS format as opposed to clicking on a link and taking it either on their laptop or on their, or on their smartphone. So again, some of those options there. The unique link really wouldn't worry about too much. We see some individuals or some individual clients, what they want to do is they want to sync up with their own mailing system. So they'll have Qualtrics create a file of a unique links, and then they serve, they distribute those out through their own um, email system, but not a pretty common way within higher ed. And I'll also touch on a few. I mentioned the offline app. The way the offline app is, it it might mention it here. The, the way you gain access to that, you would go to your app store, like your Apple app store. You click on, this will actually just show where to get it. You click on the app, you download it, you log into your account, and then it'll show you your surveys that you can download. QR code, again, this is just, a, you've probably seen these all over. Anybody who scans this with their phone can take the survey, so you can download that, print it out, put in newsletters, put on banners, anything like that. And then social media, this is just if you want to push out to a social media page. So if you have like a departmental, um, you have a departmental Facebook page or Twitter account, you can, you can post those, allow the individuals to take the survey from there. So moving along, um, I'm actually going to pull up a survey to talk about some of the data analysis. I'm going to pull up a survey to, to highlight some things now available. Let's see. So this first part I'm show, showing here, this is something that's fairly, fairly new for you all. This is what we call our text analysis or text IQ. This is a way to, it actually is an AI. Um, a way to analyze comments or any type of qualitative feedback. So this is a this is a basic uh, analysis on it. this was like a survey about uh, clothes and um, a, a website interacting with those shopping or certain clothing items. But the idea here, this was just a very basic one that we set up. The system will recognize reoccurring topics, so it's not based off of just a word. It can be a collection of words or just a general theme. And then what it's going to do is it's going to assign, it's going to look for sentiment. And sentiment, again, is going to be broken down between very negative, negative, mixed, positive, very positive, and neutral. So based off of um, the words, the connotation, uh, again, this is an, it, it runs on an AI, so the more responses that come in, the better. But even on lower response counts works very well because it compares it to just natural language. And then we can see, again, what some of these common topics are, as well as the sentiment around them. We can also take this data. Uh, well, I'll actually show this real quick. This will just give an example here. 
this is looking at the different topics that this would get assigned to. It looked at the general overall sentiment. So we can see that. Uh, we can also click on any of these and we can modify them, meaning that if we wanted to override the system and say, actually, this topic should have been assigned, it will start to also steer the AI in that direction as well. Uh, this is how we can go in here. We can search for topics, we can assign topics. And this is where, where we could go in here and actually say, okay, for this, this particular comment, for some of the comments, other topics I would like to assign, I can add topics. Just would name those there and then assign them as, as you would want to. So generally what this is doing, this handles any of your qualitative feedback. As well, you can also take raw data and then upload that into Qualtrics. It doesn't have to be survey data. So if you, if for example, you run focus groups and you had somebody who was a note taker or somebody who recorded the whole focus group and then went through and transcribed it and took the text, you could put the text into here and you could do a sentiment analysis as well as a topic analysis. And it'll find again, reoccurring topics as well as the sentiment around those topics. Again, just showing some of that there. So for example, if we wanted to click on a topic over here on the left, it's going to pull up the topic. We can also look at subtopics. So with under cleanliness, we're going to find other things. So these were the other ones, clean, dirty, disarray, discussing, restroom, stain, and some of those others. So again, something recently rolled out with is the ability to, to handle some of that qualitative data. I think, yeah, there was a link chatted over to, to learn more about it. Another thing that was recently rolled out with, this is what, it's what we call Stats IQ. Um, let me, well, I guess it would show this one. Most of this data in the survey was qualitative, so it wouldn't be very relevant here. Generally speaking, Stats IQ is what we call a hard stats program. So for those that have used Qualtrics in the past, our general reporting, which we'll show here in a few minutes, is meant to be a, a visual reporting aid, meaning that you can create basic charts and tables and gauges. So if you want to pull up histograms or pie charts or breakdown bars, that's all done as our general reporting. But historically, researchers have exported their data from Qualtrics and they upload that into a system like SAS or Stata or more commonly SPSS. Sometimes we're seeing R pretty popular as well to manage what we consider more of those hard stats. So that would be your correlation, cluster analysis, factor analysis, um, running pivot tables, anything like that. So this is how we could do this here. Uh, this first one was looking at, again, I'll pull up a different survey just because this first, these first items, this, there's a question in the survey about how many stars you would give, classic, you know, Amazon stars, one through five. So it, this is just showing a breakdown of that type of question. So it's showing how you know, how wide the data is. So we have you know whatever this was about fifty eight hundred out of ten thousand total responses were five stars. They all fell generally um, within a certain range. In this case, actually, um, this was a percentage that they gave, and then a star was assigned. So generally, for the five stars, those were within the certain range. So this one, not really of an interest in just looking at if it was finished or not. So it, as an example, if you wanted to look at when your surveys were taken, this is showing by end date. This is breaking this out across a, a couple year period. We see a lot of times researchers will be interested in understanding how their survey was taken, meaning what days, what time of days, what time of week, just to better gauge for future semesters when a good time to distribute would be if there was a better time to hit their inbox or if there's a more convenient time for individuals to take these surveys, it's it's fairly powerful to, uh, to see that data and, and to use that for future generations. Craig, would you uh, identify the times of day, revealing the time of day, that, whereas that's a whole year, is there a better time of day, for example? To there is, yep. Yeah, I think this particular was just showing start, showing summary of end date, but we can also pull in as, a, as one of the, the variables the actual time it was taken. 
So then we could categorize. We can also do time frames. So we could we could pull up a curve to show how it was distributed on those that took it between twelve to one, one to two, and so forth. Yeah. But this one was just showing by dates first. So just trying to see real quick. Most of this data was qualitative, so it's not really as relevant with doing what we consider more traditional hard stats. Uh, I was just going to see if I could find one real quick, and if I can't, I can go into. Okay, here what might be interesting. Okay, um, now this is correlating to nah. The idea with the stats program obviously is to um, find things that are statistically, statistically significant. That's why everything here is just shown. There's no statistical evidence um, or no statistical test that could be run because it's it's data. This type of data wouldn't allow that. So let me see if I could pull up another one. If not, I can I'll leave it at that. But again, the idea, it, what, what is powerful, it's fairly powerful for you to, for users that don't have a strong background in stats. They can quick, they can pull the data within here. They wouldn't have to worry about cleaning it because it's all just survey data from Qualtrics. They get, if, you, if you pull some data outside of Qualtrics, you would need to go in here and clean up the data. And what we mean by that is just to ensure that the way that it's formatted, the way that it's scored is consistent or that it's done at either, you know, are we looking at numerical data, are we looking at ratio data, interval data, to set it up correctly. And the idea is, again, for researchers that don't have a strong background in stats, they can quickly go through and find items that are statistically significant. So if we wanted to set a key item, as an example, what if, if we wanted to put an age range, and if we wanted to find a correlation between age range and how many stars or what level of review they gave. so. If there's anything statistically significant to show that millennials are more likely to give more positive reviews or more negative reviews, that's an example of how we do that within here. Uh, unfortunately, in this data set, I don't, we don't have anything that that pulls in their age range. So there's not a key variable we could, we could run against. So, anyways, just something available there. That, that's what we call stats IQ. Um, predict IQ. I don't think that's actually something in beta. Um, it really won't spend any time on it. It's just a way to understand what we call churn or um, to predict if individuals are going to do something. The other thing this is pretty commonly used is just cross tabulation. So for those that are doing chi squared analysis, this is where we can come in here. We can choose columns, items in our column, items in our rows, and we can run a cross tabulation. Do that right there. So pretty basic there, but for anybody, this is common within the surveying world just because by default, most survey data is categorical in nature. So we would be wanting to do chi squared analysis is pretty common just because we were typically comparing categories. And again, this data set, it was all qualitative in nature, so it really wouldn't be relevant as far as doing a chi squared analysis or cross tabulation. But again, I can send over a link as well on this. This is, again, for those that are familiar with cross tab, it's pretty basic on how to do all that. Uh, the only other thing I was going to mention, so I'll stop that. Oh, too late. It's just that if you wanted to download the raw data, I was just going to show that real quick. You can pull the data out as a CSV file, an SPSS file, an XML file. Well, this is actually create a response export. Um, really wouldn't want to do that. So again, if you wanted to download this as a CSV, tab separated, same thing, cell spreadsheet, XML, SPSS, if you want to put this into Google Drive, as well as something available now is if you wanted to pull this into a Tableau, um, Tableau dashboard. So if you have access to Tableau, this is what you, Tableau will request what's called a web, a web data connector link. And so that's what this is here. So you would take that, you would put that into the web data connector section. And then as survey responses come in, they can dynamically be pulled into Tableau. Yep. So again, that's if you just want to export the raw data. And the last section I'm just going to highlight here, this is just our what we call our general reporting section. There's actually two of them. Um, let me move my zoom bar. 
The first one is, this is just if you want to have the system give a really basic overview. It just goes through question by question. It will recognize the type of data that's collected and then by default pull in a, a visualization that's best representative of that type of data. So this example, this example, this was our star question. How many stars would you give for this purchase? One through five. Um, this most commonly will be represented in such a way. But if we wanted to say, hey, pull this into a, a pie chart, we can do that. We can change the coloring, things like the inner radius. So quite a bit of flexibility as far as how you would want to represent all that. If you wanted to label things, so in this case, we pulled in the default survey labels, which was one through five. But if you wanted to actually change that to say, one would be very bad, two bad, three neutral, so forth, we can relabel those. And if decimals are applicable here, you can choose how many would be represented. But again, this most common, probably the most commonly used reporting engine is the results tab, just because it's it's used for very basic analysis. And there's additional things you can do in here where you can come in here and add filters. So if you wanted to filter by, oh, let's say any type of embedded data field, let's say we did have the students here in school. We could pull that in and so we could filter out and say, hey, create a filter for the freshmen, a filter view for the sophomores, and so forth and so forth. And that can be represented there. Oh, and the last thing to show in this results section is just when we do have the report built out, there's a few, a few things that we can do. We can pull it out as a PDF, as a Word doc, CSV file. You can also manage the public report. What happens here is that you can create a link, you can share this out. Anybody who clicks on the link and refreshes it will see an up-to-date version of the data that's collected so far. And then lastly, I'll show just more, more commonly used. It's just our what we call our reports page or reports tab. This is when you can go and create a, a report, but with a lot more granularity, um, meaning that you have the ability to Oh, come in here and add you know, a cover page, add a synopsis or summary, type anything out. You can then choose, oh, for example, if we wanted to pull in our stars question here, we can very similar of how the data gets represented, but now we can put this in a similar to like a, a PowerPoint experience where we can size things up, put everything within here, um, add logos, summaries. Um, graphics so if there are other visualizations from other systems that we wanted to pull in here we can put all that in there and then we can go in there and very similar once we're done with this report we can export it uh, you can share it similar way public report link where you can create a link for someone to click on and, and refresh as well as we can download the pdfs um, once these are done it's created as a pdf so once it's as, as a pdf you can then import that as you can put those incorporate that with the powerpoint view it as a word the Word doc or Google Drive or just online. So and again, this this one using the same capabilities as the other reporting engine. It just allows a lot more granularity on how we represent our visualizations and, and everything else. So. So yeah, this time I would say that's a pretty high level inter overview. I'm going to look at some of these other things here that are included. Uh, let's see, I'm just going to go through these real quick. Advanced question types, we we touch on the file upload signature. API capabilities, I can sit over a link on this. Generally speaking, API is used by those individuals that want to connect um, systems to Qualtrics or connect Qualtrics to other systems. As an example, if you wanted to create an API to connect survey responses to your SIS and you wanted to upload information about your students within your SIS. That's how the API is used. Um, it's usually typically not something that's broadly used across the university just because it's only individuals, typically than IT, that want to sync up with other systems. Uh, data isolation is just, it's, there's, we can link to that, but it's basically the way of how Qualtrics stores data. It's just a more secure way. Generally speaking, when it comes to data security, Qualtrics is pretty top of the line. And there's a bunch of compliances that we adhere to, but this just essentially assures that how data is isolated on a server shard level. Um, let's see, 
additional languages, you know, we, we constantly are coming up, uh, coming out with different languages that we can translate into. So we have an automatic translation capability. Let's see. Expert review. I can actually show that that's, that's when we actually go live with the survey. Qualtrics will go through the survey. It has an AI. What it does is it, it will look at if there's any errors in the survey, simple things like spelling errors. It will also tell you if uh, certain questions might be confusing or confounding and a better way to, to write those questions. It will also provide recommendations on the length of the survey, how things might be constructed in a better way. And again, this is just based off of all this information that we have about how surveys are best, best launched and, and best used. Let's see, XM directory talked about um, sense of data handling and policy. This this is something that might be more relevant for the, the IT folks here, but as admins, you do have the ability to put in what we call sense of data policies, which just will prevent end users from asking certain types of questions. So it will it will provide them warnings if they um, were to ask certain kind of question. Yeah. As an example, we find a lot of universities that will have policies that prevent researchers from collecting certain types of data points. An example might be if a researcher asks for a student's driver's license number. Those universities are going to have data policies that say, like, you can't, you can't ask those type of questions. You, we don't want you holding that type of data. So if they do attempt to ask a question like that, it will, prevent a, it will provide an error or provide a warning to them to not do that. So stats IQ like talked about. Cross tabs, the Tableau integration, which was a web data, connect, web data connector, Google Drive, which was a, one of the options on the data exporter and the offline app there. Yeah, those were covered. Um, again, I would say that's kind of a high level overview of what Qualtrics can do. Um, any, any questions or anything else I can help with or help clarify? No, this, this is Rick. Great. Great job. Thank you so much. It was fast and concise and probably just perfect for a recording. Um, one question that might come up, at least for me, is how do you think about the, uh, you went over some of the most commonly asked questions sometimes. Like, for example, I went into the weeds about the consent document as we need, sh should we talk to the IRB office uh, when we have those questions? Or is there someone such as yourself or at Qualtrics that we should tap into? Should we go to the library of videos that Qualtrics provides? Is YouTube the best resource? Like, where do we go to follow up is kind of the broad question that I'm asking. Yeah, you can always follow up with me, and I can also I can always provide um, any level of information. I can also point the right resource. We have our, our Qualtrics, Qualtrics community. Let's put here just to Google that. Um, the, the Qualtrics community is made up of just other Qualtrics users, so they they post things about best practices, um, best way to do things. Um, it it can be a variety of things, so it's even things outside of surveying, just best data management, best practices around that, and so forth. As well, this is fairly useful for anybody who's just getting started with Qualtrics. You can just Google Qualtrics Basecamp, or you can click on it here. What the base camp is, is just a set of resources and tutorials that you can go through to train yourself on Qualtrics. There are certifications. You don't have to take the certifications. That's just for those researchers who want to be what we call Qualtrics certified. Um, and that could be a variety of purposes. But again, you can use these resources to take courses or you know, getting, getting help with Qualtrics. We see it's a pretty useful resource for when professors teach survey methods or research methods, they might dedicate a couple class periods to Qualtrics in itself. And so what they'll do as an assignment is they'll, they'll ask students to go through one of just the basic, um, well, some of these are a little more advanced. Let's see if I can get real quick. I'm actually just in this link so you can find it easier, but there's one called Getting Started with Qualtrics. And it's just a, a great way of understanding how to actually get into Qualtrics, uh, building out surveys, 
send out those surveys for an analysis. So, yeah. And obviously, as you can see, there were quite a few other tutorials. So everything around best practices, analyzing feedback for text IQ, which was, uh, that was the analysis system for the qualitative feedback. So, yeah, so importing surveys from other systems. So you, you can, and I'll, I'll just kind of give my opinion on this as well. If if you're working with a system like SurveyMonkey or uh, some of those other providers, if, if you just get that document, the survey itself as a a text doc, and you can actually Google this, you can import that into Qualtrics. Uh, the reality is, there's never going to be a a nice integration between um, survey providers just because they're obviously competitors to us. But this just gives an overview of what that file might look like. You know, we have the question header, a space, and then the choices. So pretty useful for getting basic questions into Qualtrics. Um, again, this just shows how you actually upload that. The other thing as well is what we do with the data. So I got to move my Zoom bar again. Sorry, I lost my screen. Okay, this should be back now. Anyways, the other thing I was going to show as well is importing responses because as you can imagine, you're going to have data typically as a CSV file, and you're going to upload that into Qualtrics, and this just goes over how to upload all that in there. So you prepare the survey, you prepare the file. It's going to ask you, uh, it's basically going to line up certain columns with each other. So just to ensure that everything parses correctly, this is just going to go through. It's going to provide um, the status of the the upload if anything goes left, like that. So, yeah. uh, any other questions or anything to help clarify? Yeah, I got a quick question. Uh, yeah. If it's okay. Um, it's a nice presentation. Thank you for for putting that together. You covered a lot of ground. Um, with regard, and and it seems like you guys have expanded some of the analytical options, which is interesting for me. And in particular, my question is, um, aside from let's say the descriptive options and the uh, the kind of univariate options and and sort of really uh, fairly primitive, uh, you know, bivariate options, do you have do do you now provide access to uh, more sophisticated uh, inferential statistics, for instance, just, you know, regression or, or you know, a regression, any un, and variance on regression. Yeah. Um, and this might be helpful. I can send this over afterwards as well, but that was what this, the stats IQ. So let's just, just give me an example. Uh, this first one was, uh, let me get down to the regression. This first parts was about bringing data in. There's a bunch of stuff. Okay, okay, I'm doing that. Yep. So anyway, so this is some of the guides here. So the regression. Um, so now we do simple. I'm trying to do if we do MLR. I don't know if we do. Um, but yeah, most most common we're finding within the surveying world, we're seeing regression, simple linear regression, um, pivot tables, cluster analysis. Um, but yeah, this goes to more detail about uh, as well as oh, um, any errors, for example, like how um, you know, how the residuals are represented. Okay, this is great. Thank you for for showing me that. Can I ask a follow up question, uh, real quick? Yes. Uh, unless somebody else has a question, because we're close to the end here. The AI stuff um, mm -hmm. that you know, kind of out in the wild, the large language models have uh, error rates, and and you can ask certain questions, you can put in certain prompts, you can provide certain data 
that will actually end up uh, causing the the AI functionality to lose accuracy or or to be wrong in a number of different uh, uh, conditions. Uh, is there a, a corresponding issue with the the AI assisted stuff that uh, you guys are providing? Um, I mean, yeah. Here's just kind of my general take on on AI, and that it is it is a fairly it is a fairly new way of understanding you know, human data, especially it's a fairly newer way of understanding what we call unstructured data. Yeah, and, and the reality is, even within Text IQ, if it, it's not it, it's not great at dealing with satirical type responses. Um, it's not great at dealing with um, um, forgot the word escaped my mind, but when. Um, uh, like smart aleck responses, I guess you could say, um, and and that's something I think for for AI to accomplish and to you know that's probably the next round of conquering that. Uh, we we do provide some, and I can send this some information afterwards as well because we're caught up on time. We do we we do supply information that we call accuracy or what our understanding of the accuracy is. Again, it's 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 it's, it's a tricky world with dealing with unstructured data because as you can imagine, even we're dealing with regressions. It's very easy to say, hey, where are the residuals? How correlated are residuals? And based off how correlated everything is, we can say, is this model a good representation or is this is this a good way to represent this data? Anything with unstructured data where we're dealing with natural language is trickier because you can't sit back and say, uh, I can say with 100% accuracy that everyone who had a problem with the restrooms is now dissatisfied. It's It's almost an inference in itself um, organizations are interested in this because they have a lot of unstructured data and getting unstructured data is kind of easy to get, but they want to have a, a direction as far as where to steer. And so that's why they're interested in AI and using some of these AI models. But again, it's, if you were to write a research paper on, and you base it all off of your essentially AI data, it, you know, it's 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 almost up for interpretation because someone could actually go through and read all five thousand comments and say, uh, "I got a different assumption from that comment," or "I I came to a different conclusion from that comment, different than what the AI AI came to." Anyway, that's kind of my one one quick my yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. One quick reflection on that is where I could personally use AI to help me out is in a, a kind of related area, which is simply put, cleaning my data. Uh, that would be, you know, cleaning my real world data. It's a little bit related to structured versus unstructured, what you're talking about. But this is more like structure with, you know, data entry errors and and spurious responses like you were talking about, stuff like that. Um, but cleaning my data pre-analysis would be a very useful functionality uh, if you could, you know, maybe take my feedback forward. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely, and, and that's definitely a world that we, I, I didn't really focus too much on that. Everything I showed here is about the unstructured side, but we do, provide on the structured side as well. Um, it's just most of our use cases being around the unstructured just because most people are interested in using AI as a way to understand you know, voices or what people are talking about and things like that. Uh, but there is as well that we can do with the, the structured data and how we can think things up. And we also use, we see that researchers use as a way to point them in the right direction where they say, hey, given my data set, um, give me a model that I should look at or give me something that that is interesting. And the stats IQ can do that as well. We can basically stack everything up against itself to say what things are the most statistically significant. And while it might not, it might be a dead end, at least it gets us to a place to start. 